Man, good evening. Welcome to Midweek Church. Somebody give Jesus a hand of praise tonight. Come on, just love on the Lord, even if it's just a clap offering. Come on, sometimes even when you're crawling through your week, all you can do is clap. <laughs> it's good to see you. I hope everybody is having a good week so far. Everybody online, welcome to you. Everybody's getting ready, I think, for school to start back tomorrow and lots of things, last minute things that's going on. But I'm ready for midweek service. Amen. It's good to see you. I'm glad that you made it. Uh, we're going to jump into some praise and worship here in just a minute, but thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, finally got some rain this week that we needed so bad, so desperately. Uh, starting this past Sunday morning, some of y'all got your hair wet trying to get in and out of the church house Sunday morning. But we had a great service Sunday, and I'm just looking for Jesus to do something for you tonight, amen. I don't know what you might need tonight, but I know that Jesus can certainly do it. Amen. Stay with me. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And we're going to jump in and have, some, have a time of praise and worship. These guys up here have been practicing for over an hour. Anybody been saved besides me? All right. We've got a few people who's been saved. So let's lift up the name of Jesus tonight and let's give God some praise for everything he's done. Father, we love you so much. God, we're grateful to be in your house. We just pray the Holy Spirit would move like fire and just move by your power and your spirit in this place. And Lord, we're just asking for you to meet on every need in this house. God, I don't know what the struggle, what the need, or the situation is in someone's life today, but I know that you're the God who is able. We love you so much, God, and as we worship you tonight, our words, our, our song, our hands, our dance, whatever. We want to lift up the name of Jesus tonight in spirit and in truth. 
what's happening. On August 15th, we will be having our water baptism service. If anybody would like to participate in this service, you can sign up at CompassionChurch.net or you can go to our Welcome Center if you need any more assistance or information. On August 21st, from 6 to 8 p.m., we will be having a comedy show here at Compassion. Comedians Austin and Lev will be presenting Comedy with a Cause. This show is family-friendly, and at the end, we will have a love offering for Destiny Rescue. This organization saves individuals from human trafficking, so bring the whole gang out for this super fun night. On August 22nd, we will be doing a child dedication during service. If you would like to have your children dedicated at this time, please sign up at CompassionChurch.net or go to the Welcome Center for more help. On August 25th, we will be having our monthly birthday party celebration. Please join us in the fellowship hall following service to celebrate all of our August birthdays. On August 29th, we will be having a very big service here at Compassion. Starting out the day, we will be releasing new church merch. If you would like to order any of this new merch, head over to the Welcome Center and they can help you from there. During service, we will be opening our doors to any new members who would like to join. We ask that any new members complete Immerse Course Step 1 and Step 2. These classes are held on the first and second Sunday of every month at 9 a.m. If you have any more questions, please see Pastor Travis. Following the service, we will be heading outside to have our tailgate party. Please be sure to wrap your favorite sports jersey and come out for some church-wide fun. If you forgot your wallet or checkbook, Compassion has many ways to give. You can choose any of these sources and they are safe and secure. If you need any assistance, our Welcome Center is here to help. If you are joining us online and would like to come visit us in person, you can plan your visit now at CompassionChurch.net. Just select the Plan Your Visit tab, fill out the form, and we'll be looking forward to seeing you in service. We even have a parking spot just for you. Don't forget to sign up for our text blast. This is the easiest way to stay updated and informed about anything happening at the church. Just text at CCTN to number 81010. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. If you need any assistance, our Welcome Center is here to help. And that's what's happening. Amen. Busy month for August. Really looking forward to it. The next thing that's going to be coming up is going to be um, a week from this coming Sunday on the 15th is going to be Water Baptism Sunday. So if you or anybody that you know has been saved or rededicated your life, haven't been baptized before, or if you want to be rebaptized, you need to let me know so we can get you, uh, get you down on a list uh, of everybody who's going to be doing that that day. It's going to be a really special time on that service. Invite your friends, family to come and be a part of that. That's going to be a super special day. Really looking forward to it. So don't forget all these things, uh, lots of stuff I know. This is going to be a very busy month, but keep everything in mind. I won't go over all of them again. But uh, lots of important things happening, and especially water baptism and membership Sunday. Membership Sunday is going to be important too. So if you want to join the church and you have not already let me know, please do that very soon because we need to get everything buttoned up for that too. Amen. It's going to be a great month in August. Uh, we're so excited about uh, everything that's going on. Parents are excited about school starting back, getting a break, getting to just uh, you know breathe again. Come on. Kids are sad. Parents are excited. Praise the Lord. All right, again, it's so good to see you tonight. It's good to see you for if you are joining us online. Thank you for joining us on there. Um, I'm going to, at this time, any of our kids and teenagers are going to be dismissed. Go ahead and let you be dismissed now. We're going to jump into a little word I have for you tonight. Try not to take up a whole lot of time. Amen. Good to see you. And if you're online, comment on there and let us know. Don't just stalk us on there. Comment and say something, say hello. And tell us that you're here. Amen. Before I jump into the word, I'm going to lay a little bit of a brief foundation, but I'm going to be in the book of 1 Timothy here in just a couple of minutes for everybody here or watching us. A long, 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 long time ago, April the 10th of 1912, the Titanic. I used to love the Titanic and, and so, was always so fascinated with the story of the Titanic left a Southampton in England for uh, the New York Harbor. Many warnings were issued during that time, actually, they state, um, about the icebergs and different things that were going to be en route. And a lot of those warnings and calls were ignored, and they state at around 11.40 p.m. that the Titanic struck an iceberg on the starboard side of the ship. 
The, the history tells us that the water began to come into the ship at an alarming rate, and within only three hours of hitting an iceberg, the Titanic and 1,523 passengers sank. Only 705 of 2,228 people survived. They tried to figure out what happened to what everybody was calling the unsinkable ship during this time. People were saying, there's no way that this ship could sink. And many people agree that negligence and apathy and greed and pride and even some incompetence there uh, could have avoided the Titanic hitting the iceberg all those years ago. A French author by the name of Voltaire said, life is a shipwreck, but we must not forget to sing in the lifeboats. Amen. Sometimes I feel like that and was, um, you know, just thinking about that this past week, how oftentimes it feels like everything in our lives is just, it's difficult. I shared with the hospital yesterday at our morning devotional that it seems like so many times we're just trying to get from day to day in our daily lives because we have a lot going on. We have a lot of things happening, whether it's kids, grandkids, and we got stuff going on with work or with school or whatever. We've just got a lot of things, and there's a lot of things going on in life. We are basically, though, a ship trying to navigate our way through life. We have a lot of things we're trying to navigate, the unknown waters, and we're trying to just make it through not knowing what's out there and not knowing what's going to be uh, needed to be navigated around even tomorrow. Does this sound familiar? Sound pretty accurate to you? It kind of feels like that. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out what we're going to do in life. I have a decision we have to make. We're trying to figure out how we're going to make that decision or what we're going to do, how we're going to get there, how we're going to deal with the storms that come our way whenever it happens. How are we going to make decisions that could possibly impact us not only for years to come, but even for the rest of our lives? It's real deal life, things that we're always dealing with. And some of us, we have not sailed for very long, and a lot of us are trying to learn what it is, you know, and we're either like Johnny Depp on the Pirates of the Caribbean, you know, if you've ever seen that movie, you're kind of like <laughs> swinging from ship to ship and trying to figure out how you can stay afloat, or others are sailing like the boss himself, like Blackbeard, you know, and the pirate, and they're just taking it and just mastering and conquering the seas. If, you're, if you are handling life like Blackbeard, I salute you. I feel like more, more like Johnny Depp sometimes. And it feel, <laughs> feel like that I'm sinking ships out of here. Come on. But most of us have probably never been shipwrecked at sea in like real life. I would say most people have probably never been that way. However, it's very likely that in a spiritual, uh, in a spiritual sense that many of us have been or will at some point. And I want to help you. I want to talk to you tonight about the dangers of shipwreck in our spiritual lives. And maybe you don't even know that it's possible. Maybe you don't even know that you're heading that way but I'm going to help you try to see it, and I want to help you try to prepare for that and help you to try to avoid it. Because your life does not have to end up badly. Your life does not have... Listen, people who've made some terrible decisions even after knowing Jesus and all these things that have ruined a lot of years in their life, it doesn't have to be that way. Although God restores and, and makes all things new, but it doesn't have to be that way. Sometimes I believe we can avoid that. Our scripture is going to show us the nature of spiritual shipwrecks and how you avoid and uh, avoid making them in your life, or at least as, as much as you can. I hope I gave you enough time to get to 1 Timothy. We're going to be in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1. Let's go 18, and probably just read a couple of scriptures here. Here's what your Bible said. This I charge you, or excuse me, this charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you. This is Paul writing a letter to Timothy, by the way that by them you may wage the good warfare, having faith and a good conscience, which some, having rejected concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck, of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Father, bless your word tonight. Encourage us. Give us wisdom, revelation, and all, as always, just uh, lift up our eyes to what is at hand. And just give us the power and the strength always to overcome. In Jesus' name, somebody say amen with me. The reality of being spiritually shipwrecked in our life is so real and is so, it's so tangible because it can really be any of us, any person. Nobody is susceptible of going around it. And Paul is calling for two men who have been shipwrecked, and we don't really know a whole lot about them, but it was a major problem for the early church. It was a major problem for, for them. And, and Timothy is a young pastor, and Paul's trying to write this epistle or this letter. He's trying to explain some things to, to him, and Hymenaeus began to teach a false doctrine. Well, that's a huge deal, in case you didn't know. That's a big no-no. <laughs> so now that's the first thing. And then we see this other guy, Alexander, who 
who the Bible tells us has been given much injury to Paul. He's causing him a whole lot of problems. There's a whole lot that's happening here. No doubt that we probably all can think of somebody who has caused some spiritual shipwrecks in, in life, and probably even with you, with some things that you have done or faced or maybe things that have been wrong in your life and, that, and caused you to stumble. And maybe you, can, you, can just, you know exactly some people who have caused that. Although we can't blame it all on them, certainly the devil can use people to, uh, to have a hand in us shipwrecking ourselves. What you and I have to remember this evening, though, about this is that spirit, being spiritually shipwrecked, it just doesn't happen to the other guy. Again, nobody is susceptible to escaping that. You and I are able to do that. We see an alarming rate pastors and church leaders who have, uh, who have made enormous mistakes in their past from anything from drug abuse and adultery and all these things. And they are some the people, uh, even recently a pastor from New York City, I believe it was, just, it was possibly last year, pastoring thousands of people and had fallen to, uh, to an adulterous relationship. And so we understand that this can happen to anybody. Nobody is immune to the possibility of sin. That's nobody. That's all of us, included, including pastors or leaders or whoever. Everybody's susceptible to that. So we don't scoff at the danger of sp being spiritually shipwrecked because it can happen. It can absolutely happen to anybody. First Corinthians, Paul also tells the church of Corinth in 10 and 12, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed, have a warning, in other words, unless you fall. What the Bible is trying to tell us is that we have to put ourselves on guard. We are guarding our hearts against things. We have to guard our minds and our thoughts. I mean, no, you've got to be really careful because the devil will always come in between your ears to begin a thing. And it begins a, a spiritual battle and temptation and thoughts. All of those things take place up here. And then we have to guard our actions because if we're not careful, we begin to act upon things that we've entertained up here. And then we, we find that there are motives behind our, action, our, our actions that are really dangerous. It's just like if I, if I had taken this glass of water and put just a little bit of poison in there. Not much, just a, just a couple of drops. And I put this in there and I told you that you could just have a little sip of it every day. And it probably wouldn't do you know, a whole lot of, of harm to you. Just have a little bit every day. And, and the reality of it is, there's none in there. It's pretty good. The, rea the reality of it is, though, is that what, what we are doing when we, when we partake of sin, which, by the way, is what sent Jesus to the cross to die in the first place, so in my walk with God, I'm not trying to see how close to that line of sin and, and running with the devil that I can be and also serve Jesus. Come on, we got to get that out there first. That's not what we're trying to do as Christians. That's not what we're trying to do as believers. We are, we are to strive as hard as we can to stay away from sin. We know that. But we don't just partake a little bit every single day and just say, yeah, it's fine. It's not going to kill me. I'll be okay. And the reality of it is, is you are setting yourself up for a very dangerous place. The reasons that spiritual shipwreck begins to take place, Paul tells us again that the reason that these two men here that we're talking about suffered shipwreck was because they, quote, put away their faith. They put away their faith in God because what, what was happening here is they, they began to push away everything that was a godly influence in their life. They began to push away things um, like, like their meetings, pushing away the time with God, pushing away their prayer, pushing away reading scriptures, and, and even began out in false teachings and false doctrines, Paul said. They were pushing everything away that would have any godly influence. And what this is referring to is an intentional turning away from truth to error, intentionally turning away from, for example, God's word and knowing what is just, knowing what is true and righteous in God's eyes, and we intentionally do something that we know is wrong. It's just like mama used to say, you know better. Anybody ever heard that? Come on, your mama's always used to say it to you, grandma, they tell you all the time, you know better than that. You know better. And for a long time when I was a kid, I never understood. I'd be like, why are they always trying to tell me I know better? Like, what do you mean I know better? And really, when I, when I got older, I started to understand exactly what that meant. And the truth was, is I was, I was raised with more sense than the actions that I, were, I was committing when I was a kid. The stupid and silly little things that we do when we're young, we truly know better. And I feel like that's what happens in our relationship with God. Because God is looking at us sometimes and he's saying, you have the wisdom, you've sat through enough sermons to know the truth and the power of God, you have spiritual revelation from God, you have the Holy Spirit living within you to give you boldness, give you revival fire that you need, and you know better. 
You know better than to continue back into that sin. You know better than to go back and do the things that I have forgiven you from. God's like, you know better than to run out with the person that I had saved you from a long time ago and that relationship is toxic. You know better, you know better, you know better. And, and we make a conscious decision sometimes to do it anyway. Regarding Hymenaeus here, we, we see that it has appeared anyway, that he has rejected the true teachings of God and he's embraced false doctrines. He's embraced false teachings and he's developed this mean spirit. Y'all anybody know anybody with a mean spirit? He's developed this mean spirit and then he began to work against the Lord. How many know if you are not furthering the kingdom of God and doing things to lift somebody else up, then you become an enemy of God. There's no third direction. You can't just say, well, I just want to keep to myself. You know, that doesn't work that way because if you were not for God, you were against him. If you were not serving him, you were, you're an enemy, you're a hostile to God. And so what he's trying to do here is he's, he's rejecting the truth. He's embracing the false teachings. He gets this mean spirit. He begins working as an enemy against God. He, wounds up, he winds up rather <clears throat> being spiritually shipwrecked because he was pushing away the truth of God's word. It is the same process that takes place with people in the church. Because for whatever reason, people begin to push away. They push away from coming to church. They push away from spending time with God. They push away from reading scripture and, and beginning to, you know, from digging into God's word. They push away and they push and push and push. And they get further away. And really, the problem is, is they move from truth to error. And it's not done in an instant. It's not done immediately. You don't hardly ever find somebody who just, who just literally goes from serving God faithfully, the fire of God is in them, they go to church every time the doors are open, they're praying, they're studying, they're reading scripture, doing all these things. You don't hardly ever find somebody that does that, and then all of a sudden, in one day, they're just gone, they, they run out and throw all their Bibles away, they leave the presence of God, they don't want anything to do with the Lord, and they make some, a bunch of horrible decisions, a bunch of horrible sins, and all these things. It's a process. It's a process because what happens is you begin to entertain thoughts and your motives. Your heart is not guarded. And little by little, you start to find yourself floating away from God. And then you find yourself in a shipwreck position. Nobody wakes up and says, I'm going to completely turn away from God. Nobody wakes up tomorrow and says, I'm going to ignore everything God has ever done for me. I'm not going to have a relationship with the Lord anymore. I'm going to ignore everything that God is speaking to me. I'm going to ignore every time that I hear the word. I'm going to just fall away from him and I'm just done that quick. Nobody does that. It is a process. It's far more subtle though. And we fall away whenever we allow sin, watch this, to be unchanged in our lives. When we allow sin to be unchanged. And then what do we do? We begin to rationalize things. We begin to say, well, it's really not that bad. I know guys who are strung out on drugs and alcohol and, and really this little problem that I have, I mean, I've got it under wraps, I have it under control, it's not really that big of a deal. We begin to rationalize what we're doing, knowing that it's wrong, what God has called sin, and tells us, commands us even in his word to stay away from those things. And all of a sudden we are now rationalizing why we do that. We allow a loophole here and there. We allow things to be, you know, to, to, to come into our life. When we, when we said God delivered us from something and we were done with it, and all of a sudden we start rationalizing and then later on in life, we allow that thing to come back into our life again. And we allow that to come in. It sneaks right back in and it just, it just begin, begins to uh, be a fade and we're totally gone from where we once were. It's like you take, everybody knows the illustration, but it's like when you take a frog and you put it in a pot of water, you stick it on the stove, and if you, if you put it in straight into a pot of boiling water, it will jump out. It immediately jumps out because it knows the temperature is too hot. But they say that if you take a frog and put it into lukewarm water and begin to slowly turn the temperature up, it will boil itself to death and won't jump out because it does not realize that it's gradually getting hotter. And as simple as that is, and we've heard that our whole lives probably, that little illustration, is so true because that's what happens. Sometimes tragedy comes to the greatest ships because we allow ourselves to drift whenever we're supposed to be staying a course and staying in a certain direction and we begin to get overloaded. Have y'all ever been overloaded? I have been overloaded before. If you are not careful, you, are, you will overload yourself to the point of where you are sinking and you are taking on water at an alarming rate. If, you don't be, if you're not careful, you will overwhelm yourself to the point to where you are done. And you don't want the ship to carry on anymore. You're finished. And that's what happens. Other times, though, we just lose momentum. We lose momentum because we've got torn sails that we, we've neglected. Little problems here and there that we didn't fix. And things that have become scars, that, except they're not, some, of, some of the things that we have are not scars, yet they're still bleeding. And we haven't tended to those wounds that become infected. It's, it's festered. 
Or we have a broken rudder that's causing us to lose speed and we can't steer ourselves or go forward or anything. We are just kind of sitting in the water. Uh, and, and what happens is we begin to examine our life. We examine the things that are going on. And areas that, that we look at, sometimes I have to ask myself, what am I tolerating? What am I tolerating in my life? What am I allowing in that I know that is not supposed to be there and I'm acting a certain way? And Paul is trying to tell us, you can't just tolerate some things. You need to be delivered from some things. You can't just tolerate some things and allow them to hang out in your life. You need to be rid of those things. Where have we slacked? And I'm talking to me too. Where, where have I slacked in my relationship with God to the point to where I've allowed some things to come in and they don't need to be there? What small changes have taken place since the last time that, that you have been on fire for the Lord or, or been close to God? What things have you noticed that's been different in your life? Then when you used to be on fire for God and you could not wait to get to church or wait, you couldn't wait to serve God or be a part of his service. They will lead to you shipwrecking yourself if you don't deal with them immediately at the feet of Jesus and be restored by the power of God. The result of what happens in this, I think, is told to us here by these two men who were, quote, delivered to Satan. Now, this is insane. This sounds crazy. Delivered to Satan? Wait a second. It's like the ultimate punishment here. That church people who are away from God, away from the Lord, that this would even take place. What does that even mean? It means that you are no longer under the uh, protective umbrella of the Lord, that Satan's hand is now available to teach you some humility. That is a scary thought. But Paul told the, the Corinthian church here to do this with a guilty member of the congregation, 1 Corinthians 5 and 5, that, quote, you may deliver the flesh for its destruction to save the spirit. So he's saying it's better for you to destroy some things in the flesh and to have your spirit saved than for you to, to lose your whole soul and end up dying and going to hell. It is so much more crucial and important to that. Every person here listening, either you're here or watching online, every person who would have ears to hear this needs to understand this, that no, no one ever sins and just, just completely, uh, it just doesn't, your sins don't just disappear immediately. How many know some things come with a consequence? If you go out here and take a gun and rob the gas station right down the road, it's going to have a consequence because at some point they're going to catch up with you and then you're going to have to face some prison time. And it doesn't matter how many times you say, I'm sorry, or even repent to God for it. That's great that you've repented. You're still going to have some consequences to deal with for the actions that you've decided to make. Sin has consequences. We will always reap what we sow, whether that is good or whether that is bad. Some people are sowing things today, whether they are good things. You might be sowing the blessings of God. Some of y'all might have opened up the mailbox and saw a $500 check in there. Whoa, glory to God. I just got this $500 check. And it's because I've been paying my tithes and I've been helping the homeless folks and I've been donating extra and, and just, you know, doing what I can. I'm a cheerful giver and God has blessed me. Or there may be people out there today who are reaping some things that they have done and it's very con consequential and it's very unfortunate the things that we are reaping in our lives today. Galatians 6 and 9 said this, let us not grow weary while doing good for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. We got to continue moving forward and continue doing what it is that God has called us to do and what we're supposed to be doing. And the Bible tells us here to not lose heart. Don't, go, don't grow weary while you're doing it. Make sure that you understand that you are absolutely 110% going to continue moving forward. Listen, when a believer allows his or her life to become spiritually shipwrecked, sin and terrible consequences are always going to be there for us to pay. Sometimes that's chastisement. Amen. It's just like whenever mom and daddy had to whip your hind in whenever you're young. Chastisement's a real thing. It's a real, it's a real deal thing. And there are, there are moments whenever we are lonely. Man, loneliness sets in. You feel like you're all by yourself. And then depressed feelings. And you start feeling depression you never felt before. And you start staying awake at night and it's a problem. And then all of a sudden you start seeing that if it's, if it's been long enough that you will find yourself even in a, a spiritual shipwreck that can end up in a death away from God. People are also watching you. And what's so serious about this is people are always watching how you live your Christian life. Amen? You are under a microscope whether you want to be or not. A glass house, as we say. You are the only Bible that some people will ever read. You are the only, you are the only Bible that some people will ever read. And we lose our testimony. We lose our testimony. There should be a bold return to the methods that Jesus has advocated for us in cleansing the church. And knowing what it is to serve God. Why is that? Because of the simple fact that we're all human. We're all imperfect. We all make mistakes. 
and all of us can slip away from the path. Is this path or this thing or this sin or this person or whatever it is, is this costing, is it worth costing you everything? Is it worth costing you these things? Is it worth really uh, giving up what you're doing? Is it worth not praying? Is it worth not being able to influence your family, your son or your daughter or, or a coworker or somebody that needs Jesus so badly? Is it worth all of that, the immense spiritual cost that's attached to it? Absolutely not. Thank God that there's a remedy for it, though. And that's what Scripture begins to tell us. There's a remedy for being spiritually shipwrecked. There's a remedy for that. Paul lays out these quick five steps. I'm going to give you these. I'm going to get out your hair and let you go home and get ready for bed. These are the five things that I believe that, it, you can, that can help you recover from being spiritually shipwrecked if you have already suffered that or you can even use these to avoid one yourself. Here we go. Five things. There's healing for all of these lies and all of these things in five things. You ready for this? Number one is following following. Following is this Paul telling Timothy that he, he's giving him a charge right here in our scripture. It, a charge is a military term for a superior issue that he's being commanded. This is a superior term. In other words, what he's trying to say is you have a responsibility to obey his words. You have a responsibility to obey the word of God. And if we can't obey, then we won't ever live for God. If we can't obey, then we won't ever to be able to have a relationship with the Lord. It's godly obedience. Number two with following is fulfilling. Paul reminds Timothy of prophecies here that were issued concerning his life. And prophecies, no doubt, uh, were here of success and blessings in, our, in, in ministry. And you and I, too, we're told here in Romans 8 and 37 that we are not just conquerors, but we are more than conquerors uh, through Christ who loved us. And so it's our God-given potential to have victory is what God intended for us. Fulfill your destiny in Christ as a conqueror, family. It is in your blood as a believer. Number three is fighting. This goes without saying, but Timothy is reminded here, it is not that he is, he is enlisted in the Lord's army to play on the playground. Come on, this thing that we are facing in life, what we are navigating is not a cruise ship, this is a battleship. This is what we are doing and facing in life that we have is problems, is hard, is difficult. This is, this is a battlefield that we're on, man. It's not easy or everybody can do it. It's, it's, a, it's a problem sometimes and it's, and it's hurtful and it causes us grief. But from the moment that a new believer gets up on their knees and, uh, and, and you know from an altar of repentance and accepts Jesus, so to speak, you are immediately in a spiritual conflict because you have just declared war on every devil in hell. <laughs> you have just said that you are going to follow Jesus and you are turning away from every demonic force has tried to weigh on you. The devil is attempting to cause us to fail. He is attempting to cause us to fall, to quit, to fall short of the glory of God, and to shipwreck our faith on jagged rocks of sin. But the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, the Bible says, but they are mighty to the pulling down of strongholds and breaking chains. Amen. This is the fight we're in. Number four is our faith. Faith. Timothy is charged right here to, quote, hold onto his faith. Now, what does that mean? It means that he is to own or possess his own faith for himself. Nobody can have faith for you. Your parents can't have faith for you. Your, your, uh, your kids or your Sunday school teacher, your, your pastor, we can't have faith for you. It is that we are not to be enticed by words, just slick words of men, in other words, and just let somebody else tell us something. Those are false teachings. Come on, we, gotta have, we can't have faith in a person. We have to have faith in God. The Bible says here in our faith that we are to get a grip on the Word of God and to know what it is to learn more daily, every single day, about the fight and the attack, ultimately, that we are up against. So we've got to have faith in God and be careful that it is not put somewhere else where you will regret it later. Number five, to finish this up, is faithfulness. Faithfulness. It's different from faith. Paul reminds Timothy here to be a very good conscience. It's dangerous to operate in feelings and apart from the Word of God and leadership from the Word of God. How many know whenever you get in the Word, it will lead you? It's leadership in this Word. It will show you what you're supposed to do. Come on, the, the Word of God is, is a shepherd to you. It is a recipe for disaster to be able to lean on feelings instead of leaning on the Word of God. It is, it is a recipe for disaster. What does that look like in practical applications? We just talked about it. A pastor commits a horrible, awful, terrible sin and begins to spiral in a downward mess in his life and a bunch of people lose faith and they fall out of church. What happened? They put their faith in a man. They trusted in somebody who's able to fail. They trusted in somebody who is capable of sinning because everybody is. And they lose faith because their faith was in a man instead of having faith in God. I love a lot of people out there. I've, I respect a lot of spiritual giants out there in my life, pastors and great evangelists. 
But whenever I hear one of them falling, it just breaks my heart, and I begin to pray for them and their family. It does not make me question God and say, well, I'm done. If they can't make it, I don't have any hope. It's because I don't put my faith in them. My faith is in Jesus. It's dangerous to operate in your feelings. Amen? And we don't have, it, it, it's, there's no spiritual framework uh, outside of the Word of God to guide the conscience. Amen? When we are faithful to God, I believe that He will always be faithful to us. Amen? Sometimes, even in our ignorance, God is still faithful when we are knuckleheads. Thank God, because I can do that a lot of times. I'm going to close with this thought and round it back up to the Titanic we opened with. In 1912, the world, <clears throat> excuse me, the world was amazed at the RM, RMS Titanic the most spectacular ship that was afloat, handsomely appointed and decorated with the best things that the world had to offer. Gorgeous. And if you've ever seen the movie, I'm sure it was very similar to that, maybe even more, uh, more beautiful than we, than we even realized. But people expected years, years of faithful service from this ship. Can you imagine being one of the people there, seeing and beholding it with your eyes before it takes off and sets sail? thinking, man, this is, going to, this is going to be around for years and years to come. This is going to make a lot of people so happy. This is going to be faithful service. It's going to make mountains of money to its owners. This is going to be a phenomenal, phenomenal thing. Yet because of errors, because of negligence, because of mistakes, it became shipwreck, and it took lots of lives with her. What will be said about your life and about my life? What will be said of us? Will we be able to quote the words of Paul here, 2 Timothy 4 and 7, where we can say, I have fought the good fight of faith. I have finished the course. I kept my faith. Will people be able to say that about us? Or will they be more like our life is standing as a memorial for people to be careful when they watch you because you veered off course and you wrecked yourself, only to be wrecked upon even more jagged rocks of sin and mistakes and neglect and not walking with God? I believe with all of my heart, I'm going to close with this statement, I believe with all of my heart that there is an iceberg, so to speak, out there with your name on it. We know it's sent by none other than Satan himself. And if you are unprepared, I believe that when you arrive at its location, when you come up on that, I believe that if you're not really careful, you will hit it and you will wreck yourself and you will watch yourself begin to sink. I don't know what the iceberg looks like for you. I don't know if that looks like drugs or alcohol or pornography or if it looks like something uh, that is causing an extra attention from a uh, male or a female at work and then it's beginning to look like adultery. I don't know what that iceberg is for you personally, but I promise you it's going to be something that's going to be hard for you to steer around. And if you're not careful, you will run right into it. We never know what's going to happen to us. That much is true. But whenever we're prepared in life, regardless of the temptation, regardless of the trial that you face, Regardless of anything, the tragedies even that you are up against, we can safely navigate the seas, I believe, in our life. God will give you grace to be able to navigate yourself and make it. Amen. I just, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to get us to understand that we will land safely, I believe, in the pristine harbor of glory with our testimony. And in fact, we can still say, I kept my faith in Jesus. I trusted in God even when it was difficult. I navigated every single obstacle that was in my way. I got around it because I, I kept... Uh, good care of the ship, so to speak. I kept everything intact. I watched every place that looked like it was starting to give way. And Jesus, in his grace and glory, has helped me make it. Look what the Lord has done. Amen. Father, we give you praise, and we're so grateful that the word is not only encouraging, but it is also challenging to us. I am so grateful that you give us warnings to heed, God, before we make grave mistakes or huge um, decisions that will affect us for the rest of our lives. I believe for, for some of us, if not all of us, that there is a time very soon where we will be faced with what, uh, what we are talking about here tonight, a spiritual shipwreck or even a, a spiritual iceberg, so to speak, that the devil will try to throw our way to cause us to go off course and to crash. But Lord, I'm so grateful that if we are in tune with your Holy Spirit, that your word has promised us strength that your word has promised us safety and refuge, and that I, as we begin to study and do a teaching like this tonight, we can remind ourselves that there is power still in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would encourage us and strengthen us, and for anybody who may have the slight, uh, slightest bit of negligence in their lives, in their heart, or whatever they're dealing with, I pray tonight that you would help them to know what it is to remember, to tend the fire, and to continue on the course. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, family. Thank you for being here tonight. I hope you have a wonderful week. For anybody that has kids, I hope they have a great uh, week starting back at school. I love you all. Please make sure you are here Sunday morning at 1030. Don't forget lots of stuff going on, water baptism, church membership, 
Uh, we have all sorts of things happening this month. Our tailgate coming up at the end of the month, too, after service. Uh, so that's going to be so great, and you don't want to miss it. I love you all. Hope you have a great rest of your week, and we look forward to seeing you Sunday morning at 1030. God bless you.